Caddyshack to Corner Office with the one and the only Mr. Corey Pavin. Corey, it's great to have you. Thanks. Good thing there's an only one and only a me, that's for sure, for the rest <laughs> of the world. <laughs> well, look, thank you for so, so much for taking some time. I know you're busy, you're on the road, you're competing right now, but yours is one that I've had some proximity to, having been a caddy at Bel Air and unfortunately getting to play my golf at Bel Air, and it's it's just stuff of legend and stuff of lore and just kind of a, a perfect fit for Caddyshack Corner Office to kind of help expose this facet of the game to more people, especially younger people. So really, really, really excited to dive into this. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully it'll be interesting to people. <laughs> well, can you tell us just a little bit about where you first started caddying? I don't even know if it was at Bel Air first and, and how you kind of arrived there. Well, it was. Bel Air was the first place I really caddied at. Um, you know, I, obviously I went to UCLA and UCLA is fairly close to Bel Air. It's right across the street. And our coach at that time is Eddie Marins, who was also the head professional or director of golf, whatever the title is, at, at Bel Air. So, um, you know, me as a college kid, just like probably every college kid, it seems like, in the world, uh, didn't have much money. And, you know, I, you know, we, we played at Bel Air uh, for the team. Uh, we played a couple times a week. And uh, I, I'm very... You know, I noticed things and I saw that there was caddies up there and I asked if there was any chance I could caddy up there. And, uh, and they said, yeah, but, you, you know, you, there's a little pecking order up here. And, um, you know, the guys that have been up here all the time and they caddy for a living, you know, they, they have priority. And, and I said, I understand that. That's no problem. And I was just looking to make some money so that I can have a few bucks to spend when I was at UCLA. As I didn't, as I said, I really didn't have any money. So it was a way for me just to get some spending money, you know, to go down and, you know, get some fast food, anything and go to the movies. Um, so that's how I kind of got started. And, you know, obviously I knew some of the members after a year or two at UCLA. I started to know a few members um, and they kind of encouraged me if I wanted to caddy to come up there and caddy. And, um, you know, as, as you know, and maybe not everybody out there knows, but, you know, I remember going down there, signing up. You know, getting up early in the morning, you know, getting there about 6, 536 in the morning, getting my name on the sign up sheet and waiting for the caddy master to call my name to to get a loop. So that caddy yard, Bel Air is very special. Caddy Corps is an incredible part of the fabric of Bel Air Country Club. But that's a that's a pro jock yard. There's a the, the <clears throat> confluence of human beings and personalities and different things that are going on. You've got some lifers, some aspiring actors. You have all sorts of great people. It's such a microcosm. What was it like walking into that yard? You're probably a little groggy, tired. <laughs> do, you, do you recall anything about that first day? Yeah, you know, I just, I remember going down there and I knew a lot of the caddies already just from hanging around up at Bel Air and playing on, on, uh, for UCLA. So I'd run into a lot of them before, but I've, I never really was down in the caddy uh, area, you know, the quarters, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, I, I know there's all sorts of names we can say for that area, but, um, but you're right. There was all sorts of different types of people down there. There were, you know, professional caddies that have been doing it and that's the way they make their living. Uh, there was, you know, guys down there that were trying to just survive in LA, whether they were actors or, you know, waiters as well. And they're just trying to make money, uh, you know, uh, and pursuing, trying to pursue other things in the future. And, you know, honestly, for a lot of the guys there that were maybe to be actors or were wanting to be actors, some pretty good connections at Bel Air if uh, you're out there catting. So, you know, I'm sure some of the guys maybe got an opportunity to to go try out for a part or something through people at Bel Air. Um, but it was a very interesting group of guys. Uh, you know, I still know some of the guys that are still up there. You know, Roosevelt is still catting up there. He's been there forever. I, I don't even know how long. Uh, but he's one of the guys I think of um, often when I think of caddies up at Bel Air. Yeah, I would imagine golf ball Eddie had to be in that yard at that time. And yeah. Tommy and New York Mike, a dear, dear friend of mine, a guy who's taught me an awful lot about life and golf. So no, yeah, no I think I think Artie was actually up there working at, at that time, who's passed away now. But uh, he ended up coming back after caddying on tour and being the, the locker room guy there for a while. He passed away a couple of years ago. Yep, I knew him well. Did, 
was it was it pretty welcoming because you knew some of the guys already? They knew you were playing for UCLA. They knew you were an awfully accomplished player. Were they saying, "Hey, Core's a good guy. We'll get him in," or was it was it the kind of, "Hey, you're, you're kind of stealing some money out of our pockets here, Corey"? Yeah, you know what? I, I think I, I don't remember any like ill feelings. I think uh, I think most of the guys down there, certainly the regulars, had their their their, their bags that they had all the time, and they didn't feel like I was taking away their job. Um, you know, honestly, I probably got all the, uh, I shouldn't say the lousy jobs, but the, maybe some of the jobs that the regulars, you know, either didn't want or they had their regular jobs. So, you know, I didn't care who I caddied for or what it was. I just wanted to make some money and yeah. have some money. Yeah. And, you know, the feeling in the yard was pretty, you know, pretty helpful, you know, that they'd help me out. And you know, he said, this is what you need to do. You need to go sign up. You need to stay over here. And this is the area. And, um, you know, most of the guys were all very helpful and, you know, they knew who I was, you know, I think that helped. Um, but I never felt, I never got the feeling from them that I was taking money out of their pockets. There was plenty of bags to, to carry, uh, you know, caddies are required out there. So, um, everybody had a job and I never wanted to take a job away from anybody. So, you know, I basically worked on, uh, on the weekends. So that, you know, everybody was playing on the weekend. So there was plenty of opportunity for everybody to caddy. And, you know, sometimes I actually go out and caddy, you know, you know, double, double loop out there and, you know, caddy in the morning, caddy in the afternoon too. So, um, you know, as I said, money was uh, scarce for me then. So anytime I had a chance to make some, I, I tried to. Sure. Sure. That's awesome. As you were making this transition, you're obviously a very accomplished player <clears throat> and a top amateur but then you're you're looping you got to stand in the right place you've got to read putts it's oftentimes trying to adjust for each individual player what was that transition like did you ever make any big mistakes in that process you know i i never remember making like a big mistake i i think you know i took it pretty slow when i went out with someone that i had never been out with before you know they get on the first saw you know what do you think it's an eight iron or nine iron you know it's like I have no idea. You know, I've never seen you play before, you know, <laughs> you know give me a couple of holes here, you know, to, to kind of understand your game a little bit. So, you know, I, I think, you know, the members and, and the players I caddied for were understanding of that. And they probably gave me a little leeway too, because of, you know, me playing golf at UCLA and they kind of knew who I was at, at that point. But, um, you know, I tried to play it smart, you know, you know, caddies are, are pretty smart people. They, they, understand how to deal with people and you learn a lot of skills you know, a lot of people skills at being a caddy um you know you don't want to you know piss off the guy you're caddying for because he's the one who tips you and gives you your money so uh you know part of it's just dealing with different personalities different types of people uh whether you're caddying for for a guy a lady um an older guy a younger guy you know whatever it is you know you have to adapt to that player and you have to be able to help them in every way you can. And I tried to do that the best I could. Do you remember some of the regulars that you were out with? Did you did you help a regular game because it was weekends? Did, did, did you kind of, I would imagine, what was it, just a couple of years, maybe two or three years that you did this ultimately? Yeah, it was about two or three years. I didn't really have any regulars. So I, I would just go up on Saturday, Sunday and just put my name in there and whoever they put me with is who they put me with. Uh, you know, once in a while I'd get the same people or they'd ask for me if I was there. But uh, for the most part, it was hit and miss and whoever was there. Um, you know, I remember I, I caddied for uh, Peter Ubroth in the LA Open Pro-Am one year. Uh, I think I may have actually played the year before in the tournament as an amateur. Uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, I caddied for him who was a, a fairly well-known guy. I mean, the guy... Uh, besides many other things, you know, he ran the Olympics in, in Los Angeles. Right. Uh, and, and I still know him to this day, you know, he's a great guy. Uh, I'm sure you know him pretty well. And, and, uh, you know, I remember catting for him at, at, uh, Riviera. I remember we were on the second hole and, you know, there's a lot of people out there watching the pro-am and, you know, he had like 220 yards to the hole and it's uphill, it's into the wind and, I said, you know, I you can go ahead and hit, you know, four wood or whatever. There's no way that, you know, it's me hard enough for you to get it there. And he caught a flyer and it flew the green into the gallery. And I was like, oh, my gosh, you know, <laughs> I, I go, I can't believe you hit it that far. You know, sorry. And he goes, I, I can't believe I hit it that far either. You know, I was, don't be sorry. You know, I, I killed it, you know. So, 
you know, it's fun to caddy for people like that. Uh, I think I was actually out there one day with Jerry West. Um, you know, there's a, a group of guys that like to, oh, how should we say this? You know, gamble a little bit out there. Um, so there's well, a one PM game always with Jerry West. Yeah, they played. They played. Uh, I think around one o'clock, right? Somewhere around there. Um, you know, I think I caddied for them once, but it was never. They never played when I could caddy. You know, they didn't play weekends. They were always out there. You know, the weekdays. And uh, but at one time I did, and I was just amazed at how fast they played. You know, they they get a cart. Each one would get a cart. So you know, I just jump on the cart, and you know, as we say, you know, I carried the putter. Um, <clears throat> give them yardage, do all that stuff. And, you know, I think, I think I probably made a decent amount of money that day, but you know, those guys bet a lot of money and I was kind of nervous catting for them because, uh, or catting for Jerry, because, you know, you, you give a wrong yardage or, you know, it can cost them a lot of money. So, you know, I was trying to be extra attentive and careful with what I was doing out there, but, you know, it's just a lot of different people, different walks of life that you meet and, and you get to hang around. And it, it was a pretty interesting time for a kid that, you know, I grew up in Oxnard and, you know, a small place and, you know, to be around people at Bel Air like that, it was very interesting and, and very insightful. You know, I learned a lot just talking to these uh, men and women out there. What were some of those biggest lessons? Because that's really it. It's this foundation. It's such an impressionable time in your life and it can be truly transformative. What, what were some of those that stood out for you, Corey? Well, I think, you know, you know, some of them are like money manager guys, you know, uh, some, said, you know, you know, take care of your money, you know, that type of thing. Uh, uh, some some kind of taught lessons on, you know, how to treat people, how to be around people, uh, which is extremely important, obviously. You know, I was just this, this you know, you know, all by myself golfer. You know, that's we don't really mix with people a lot, you know, when we're practicing and playing and working on our game. You know, we have a couple friends, but, you know, we're not social uh networking type of people. So, you know, I learned a lot from them just being around them. And, um, you know, once in a while, maybe they correct me and say, you know, you should say it this way, or, you know, this is this is the proper way to talk to somebody and uh, that type of thing, you know. But after a while, you know, it, you know, the, the caddy player relation at Bel Air is very unique. Um, I mean, I've heard caddies say things to the, some of the members that that, you know, are funny to me. But it was like, whoa, you actually said that, you know, and, 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 you know, not the most flattering thing they might say to their player, but as a caddy, you know what you can say to your player and what you can have fun with. And, and I see a lot of the caddy player relations, especially at Bel Air, are really fun. You know, it's a bond that you have and certainly learned that, you know, as I went into be a professional golfer, what that's all about. Can you elaborate on that? So... <laughs> Slightly different era, maybe not as many sponsors just flying all over the place when you're ready to go get your card. But was anyone at Bel Air helpful? Did you feel like you were really well prepared? What was that pro progression like? And did caddying and Bel Air play a factor at all? Yeah, well, there was a, a gentleman I caddied for a few times at Bel Air, and he was a money manager. And he had a wealthy client. And, and that turned out to be my sponsor, actually, when I went out on tour. Uh, and... And, you know, the member drew up the contract. It was a very good contract for me. So he helped me a lot. Um, you know, my sponsor could make money. Uh, but, you know, the whole point was to help me get, you know, get my footing as a professional golfer and be able to save some money to go out on my own. And, and it was fantastic. You know, it worked out great for all of us. Uh, a sponsor made the maximum amount of money he could make. You know, I was able to save enough money to go out on my own. And, you know, the rest was history. So, you know, that relationship that I had was was very important. And, you know, it, it led to a lot less stress for me uh, my first year, year and a half as a professional golfer. So having been a caddy, how did you then select your caddy as you became a pro? Was there was there a, a lot of, <laughs> <laughs> of filtration at that point in time or was it just, hey, this guy's going to jump on the back? Yeah, that's that's interesting because, you know, caddies back then. You know, so we're talking just to give everybody a time frame here. Uh, you know, I turned <laughs> professional in 1982. And, you know, now it's like a it's a very serious profession to go out and make a, a lot of money as a professional caddy on tour. You know, back then you could make money, but it was more of a kind of a bachelor lifestyle, you know, uh, to be married and to travel, 
you know, I, I mean, as a example, I made, I think $250,000 my rookie year in 1984 on tour. Um, uh, and typically let's say you pay your caddy 10% of what you make. Uh, that's probably a little high even, you know, for back then, uh, and a base salary. So, you know, my caddy the first year would have made, you know, maybe 40 grand, you know, that's not a lot of money. And it was a long time ago, but if you're married and have kids, that's not a lifestyle that's very sustainable. Um, so there's a lot of bachelors. When I went out on tour, I didn't get my card my first try. So I ended up playing overseas. So I, I played in South Africa uh, for six weeks and I just had a local caddy there. It was just, you know, somebody was just there and they, they kind of assigned us caddies. So it wasn't much of a, you know, looking for a caddy. Uh, and then I went to Europe and played for three and a half months. And I knew a guy that I'd met that was a caddy. And he knew a guy that was backpacking through Europe from Australia that liked golf. And I hired him to caddy for me. I had no idea. I never met this guy before. And he ended up caddying for me on tour all the way to 91, 1991. Uh, he came from Europe. He followed me over about a year later. And he caddied for me when I won the money title, too. So, um, you know, Jim was a great guy. Um, so, you know, I didn't pursue caddies. It kind of fell in my lap. And I was very fortunate because Jim, Jim Menzies was my caddy for quite a while. And he was just a very mellow guy. And it was a good fit for me. I, I don't need someone that's all hyper and running around. I need someone to keep me calm because I'm hyper enough for myself. So that's how that worked. And then my current caddy we've had since 1991, um, Eric Schwarz. Actually, the only reason I have him or a reason is when Jim Menzies, I played a tournament in Europe. I played the British Open. Then I came back to the United States for one. And then I went back to Europe for a tournament. And since Jim had backpacked through Europe, he wanted to stay in Europe for another week, you know, the week that I was back in the United States. So I said, all right, Jim, if you're not coming back to the United States, you have to get me a caddy for the week I'm back. And he picked a friend of his who was Eric Schwarz, who's still on my bag today, uh, to caddy for me. And it was at Hartford and I lost a playoff. And at the end of the year is when Jim went back to Australia to live. And I asked Eric if he wanted to work for me full time. And, you know, at that time I was playing pretty well and he jumped at the opportunity and uh, we've been together ever since. So it's it's kind of just happened, you know, to answer your question. It, yeah, I didn't go look for somebody or it wasn't a friend or anything like that. And a lot of guys today have friends come out that they've known or college buddies, stuff like that. But, you know, it just sort of happened. Uh, yeah, I'm very fortunate with the caddies that I've had. Well, it's such a critical relationship, right? It's a symbiosis. So it's a, it's, it's it's very very crucial out there. You know, we're playing and we're fairly uh, stressful situations, right. and you need someone right next to you that can you know either put your arm around your shoulder or you know sock you one in the face and say, "Come on, you know, oh, you let's get going." You won the Open '95 at Shinnecock, so I don't know how you get it done any other place. Of all the hardest places you can play <laughs> golf, it's I, it's one of my favorites. It's an absolute gem, but that's a tough track. So yeah, Eric, Eric is on my bag there too. So <laughs> help and you know. So <clears throat> if you can draw back a little bit, and we won't take up too much <clears throat> time, Corey, but the, you're this kid growing up in Oxnard, didn't have a lot of dough. Would love to hear how you got into golf and then especially for some people who are growing up that way and that's it's throughout this world golf can be so unapproachable and, and so uninviting what was that experience like for you what did your family even say and you know, what, what do you want young people to know about the game and caddying in particular yeah you know i uh <clears throat> i'll say this i you know we're a very middle middle class family so you know my dad owned shoe stores and worked really hard to keep those going and um you know what extra money they had we actually joined or i should say we they joined a golf course called las postas country club in camarillo which is a very small private club um it's not a fancy club like bell or country club um so they played golf and i have two older brothers that play um they've both been in the golf business you know uh, most of their lives and i just 
tagged along with my older brothers and played golf. Um, you know, I started when I was six and uh, I'm sure they were annoyed to have their little brother following them around, but, um, they're probably still annoyed at me for whatever reason, but, uh, you know, we, we developed a, you know, really nice relationship with, with family and with, with other golfers at the club. It wasn't a golf course that had caddies. Um, you know, but I just fell in love with golf. I loved playing it. Um, I really wanted to be a basketball player, but there were some, <laughs> there were some physical issues that I had with uh, height, ability to jump, ability to shoot, ability to play basketball, basically. So uh, I ended up obviously playing golf and I just loved the challenge of golf. Um, so I was fortunate that I had a place that I could go to and play. I played a lot of junior golf in Southern California. Uh, back then, there was a Southern California Junior Golf Association. And I'd play, gosh, I don't know, 10, 15 tournaments every summer. Um, so I, I, I cut my teeth, you know, in competition that way. Uh, and I just kept playing and playing. And my parents, you know, would give me the opportunity to compete. Uh, you know, my mom would drive us to tournaments. You know, my dad was working, so... Um, you know, we'd go together, you know, the, the, my two brothers and my mom, she'd drive us. And when my oldest brother was old enough to drive, my mom was very happy. So she didn't have to drive us mostly into Los Angeles. So, um, so, you know, that's where I got started playing golf and how I, I got involved with it. Um, I didn't really know much about caddying, uh, at all until probably really even, you know, maybe the tail end of my high school career. Um, you know, I tried to qualify for the U S open, uh, and I had somebody caddy for me, which was, was very, uh, different, you know, to have somebody actually giving me advice out there. Um, but he was an older guy and he was, uh, in the golf business and he knew golf, uh, and helped me a lot. So that was kind of my first exposure, uh, to caddying, you know, anybody helping. And I found it quite helpful, you know, and sometimes it isn't, but. Uh, most of the time it is. And, um, you know, I, I think, you know, as I went to school and I started caddying at Bel Air, um, you know, it's nice to see the other side, you know, as a, as a player and you have people caddying for you, you have an appreciation for it, but until you actually caddy yourself and are out there, you know, doing that hard work, which is very hard work. Um, you don't appreciate it until you do it. And, you know, I, I was fortunate to caddy. It helped me appreciate my caddies when, when I'm out on, you know, playing as a professional or even when I was an amateur and I had a caddy. So um, it's always important to experience something uh, firsthand. It, you can have people tell you about it all you want, but until you actually do it, you don't understand it completely. And, um, you know, I... Uh, to tell a quick little story, I actually caddied for Jay Delsing uh, in the in the uh, in the Q school. Sorry, I got a little cramped in my leg. I, uh, <laughs> Sorry, you've had a long day. We appreciate. Yeah, it. Was, yeah, it's you know playing golf's hard too, you know, but <laughs> caddying's harder. Um, <laughs> but I caddied for Jay Delsing in the Q school when they had a Q school, you know, for the PGA Tour, and you know six rounds. It was more than that, but six rounds, six competitive rounds, uh, and I actually caddied for him in the the pre-qualifying for that as well. Um, but catting for him there for six days under, you know, probably the, the biggest pressure you ever feel as a professional golfer trying to get your PGA tour playing credentials. I was exhausted. I was so tired after doing that and you know, I wasn't even playing, you know, I, and, you know, as a player, I think it was probably easier to play than to caddy. You know, I, I remember we got on the last hole, you know, the whatever 18 times six is, what's 108, I guess, the 108th hole of the tournament. And Jay was like right on the edge of making it or not making it. And I kind of knew it. And I kind of like, you know, zipped up. I was like, you know, I don't want to say anything. You know, this is so important. And Jay actually turned to me and goes, you know, what, what do you know? You know something. And I went, I don't know what you're talking about. And he goes, well, you were talking before, now you're not talking. And I said, well, somebody said something to me about it, but I don't know if it's right or not, so I'm not going to tell you what he said because, you know, I mean, he told me he was right on the line. And 
you know, I'm not going to give him that information. And if it's wrong, it's a, you know, and, and he needs to make a birdie. It's bad information to give. So anyway, he ended up, it was a par five. He ended up with about a six footer for birdie. And I'll never forget sitting there holding the, the flag stick, praying that he did not ask me to read this putt. I did not want to be responsible for misreading a putt. And, and it was funny because, you know, at the time, you know, I don't know what year it was, but it was after I'd won the U.S. Open. So you know, I'd won a lot of tournaments on tour, and I did not want that responsibility. And, and he didn't ask me, which was interesting, but he didn't ask me. And, and he actually hit the first putt, and it was a downhill fast putt. And he knocked it like three, four feet by. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, if he three putts and misses by one, this is a disaster, right? And and then with that three footer, I'm thinking, please, really don't ask me now to read this putt. And he didn't, but he knocked it right in and he made it right on the number and he got his card. And, you know, I remember sitting afterwards just after the, the round, I was just exhausted. I was mentally I was more mentally exhausted than physically exhausted, but I was tired too physically. But um, it, it it made me appreciate my own caddy so much more. I remember coming back out on tour the next year and I told Eric, I go, man, I appreciate you so much more after what I just went through. And, um, you know, I appreciate you anyway, but now it's even more. And, and he goes, he probably said something like, oh, good, I can get, you know, more out of here or something. But um you know, we have such a great relationship. He's a great, great friend of mine. You know, he's probably my best friend. You know, we've been together so long and, and been through so much. So, you know, caddying uh, teaches you a lot of things. It certainly does. Maybe most importantly, when not to speak. Yes. Only speak when spoken to. <laughs> well, I, you, I think you already answered it, but I was, it is a, a fun one. Like, What's more nerve wracking, the four footer to win the tournament when you're playing or reading the four footer for Gary <laughs> West in that cash game? And you may have already answered it. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, it's I kind of joke about it um, that he never asked me uh, to read that putt. Um, you know, I think as a caddy, you've got to be ready to take on that responsibility. You know, it, it teaches you responsibility. You know, not only just for that, but, you know, you know, there's the, the old rules, right? You know, show up, keep up and shut up, right? right? So if you're not on time, you know, that's a huge thing, you know, from my perspective as a player. Uh, and it's a huge thing for everybody. You know, if you're playing at a golf course and your caddy's not there, you know, it's like, you know, you're out of sorts already. And, you know, your caddy needs to be there on time. It's, it teaches you a lot of responsibility. Uh, and there's a lot more responsibility that goes along with caddying besides just showing up on time. You know, you, know, you have to be pro professional. Uh, you have to have information that, that your player's ready to get or, or that you could give to them, even if they don't want it. Uh, at least you have it in your head. Uh, so there's a lot of preparation into being a caddy that I don't think the average person thinks about. So that preparation if you go on to do something else besides catting, it helps you in your life. Uh, it helps you to prepare. It helps you to be organized so that whatever your endeavor is, you, you can learn from uh, being a caddy to do that. You know, so there's a lot of life lessons in being a caddy. Well said. Are, are there a fair amount of guys on tour that grew up catting or is it kind of a minority group? I think there's some that have, you know, I'm not sure if they grew up per se, you know, I, you know, we were talking a little before we started about, you know, the Evans Scholarship, uh, which yeah. is a big deal in the Chicago area. Uh, and I think, you know, there's some kids that are from Chicago, or I should say kids, but players from Chicago that I'm sure went through that program. Uh, you know, not only just to make some money, but, you know, to, you know, get some scholarships too, probably to, to college if they needed it. So, um, you know, there's programs all over the place. You know, Bel Air has one of the best in the, in the country, in the world, probably for caddies. Um, so one thing I really love about Bel Air is that the, the members take care of the caddies, you know, even through COVID, you know, there was a COVID fund for the caddies and, and it helped the caddies get through tough times, you know, like everybody had, uh, but the members try to take care of the caddies as best they can and help them out. And, you know, caddies get sick, they're in the hospital, members chip in and help. And, and it's a nice community feeling that, that there is at Bel Air like that. And, um, 
it's it's nice when a club has that bond between players and caddies. It's it's pretty cool. No question, no question, and especially during COVID, Victor Coleman and Jay Borzy were just incredibly, incredibly generous and in, in helping. Many others were, but they were incredibly generous. So, no, it's it's a family, right? I always tell people, Bel Air is it's a fraternity with a golf course, and it's not it, just the it, court, it's the staff, and just it's the it's mecca, right? You're just working all week to make sure that you got a little bit of time at the club. Yeah, it's a great place. When they when they asked me to be an honorary member, I mean, I even now I'm. I don't know if you can see goosebumps, but you know, I've got goosebumps on my arm every time I talk about it. Uh, the the golf course, the club, the people, it's the people that mean so much. Uh, it's a great place. Uh, it's a fun place. Well, look, Corey, we've taken plenty of your time and you've given us some, just an awful lot of nuggets and, and some wisdom there. I always, unfortunately, the clubhouse is down right now, but I always, always, <laughs> always show guests. There's this one photo. I don't know if you have any handy. <laughs> But it's this guy holding a rake. He's got this killer stash. I think there were some very debonair brown pants. It's yeah, a little, a little bit, a lot more, of hair, a little more lettuce than you got right now. <laughs> but people are always in awe. Like, That's Corey Pavin. Corey Pavin caddied here, and it is kind of it's it's a it's a big story and a narrative, and it's honestly just a an honor to get to not just chat with you at the club when you're by, but to get this down. And, and uh, we really, really, really appreciate it. Yeah, it's funny. I think anybody who's been up at Bel Air has seen that picture in there. It, it, well, I used to be in the in, in the locker room, but it'll get back up there, I'm sure. But yeah, I remember sitting there, you know, it was, I know exactly it's to the, the left of the 11th green and, and I'm, I'm leaning on the bunker and Aubrey Duffy I was catting for is the semifinals of the of the club championship. Uh, unfortunately, he was playing uh, Ted Ted Ray, right? Ted Richards, sorry, Richard, Ted Richards, yeah. which was like team championships or something. Yeah, like that. it was an automatic loss for for Aubrey, unfortunately. But but uh, you know, it was fun, and and that picture, I can't tell you how many times. I mean, you're saying it, but I've anybody who goes up to Bel Air, they seem to somebody points them to that picture and goes, "Look, that's Corey Pavin when he was, you know, 20 years old." and had a big bushy brown afro and glasses and um there i was and people go no way that can't be him <laughs> but that Corey, that's quite literally that photo really epitomizes what caddyshack the corner office is and what you've gone and, and done in your hall of fame career and it's just uh truly truly remarkable and an honor so we'll tell any stories you want for as long as you want but i want to be very <laughs> sensitive of your time i know you've got to get some sleep maybe get some dinner and you know you're gonna you're gonna play great tomorrow. We know that. Well, I appreciate you having me on. I think it's a great show. You know, I I've, I watched one of them, and uh, it's pretty cool to get stories out there. You know, it's uh, golf's a great game, uh, and there's more more to golf than just playing it. Uh, there's a lot of facets to it. You know, not only caddying. You know, there's the professionals, the professionals at the course. You know, the superintendent. Everybody takes care of the golf course. There's a lot that goes into it everybody that works at the golf course and, you know, caddying is a great, a great way to learn a lot of things. Uh, and, and it's a great way to be mentored in certain ways by the people that you caddy for. Uh, sometimes even caddies mentor the players that happens as well. Well said. Well, Corey, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing it with you sometime, maybe with Mr. Potus when you make it to town and uh, good luck for these travels and, and this, this stretch of playing. Okay, I'd like to get together with you, Kai. Thanks for having me. Take care, Corey. Have a great you night. Too. Corey?